morning, everybody. Welcome to Board Game Breakfast. And I just realized we are 10 episodes away from Breakfast 400. So that would be in August, September, October. Interesting. Maybe we'll do something for that. We'll give out $400,000. No. <laughs> um, but we do have giveaways that we can give away right now. So if you want to enter a contest, a brand new contest for today, this is for a copy of The Loop, which you might see behind me here. This is the, well, this is the original version, a new version from Pandasar's game, which is essentially the same thing. There's just minor changes. We're giving away three copies to folks who live in USA, Canada, or Australia. All you have to do to enter this contest is to email us at contest at dicetower.com. In the subject line, put the word time, as in something we all have the same amount of, and answer the question in the body, what color is the central plastic tower that is used to disperse cubes through different eras? Now I'm trying to think what that color is myself. I know I've seen the color. It's either blue, pink, orange, green, or yellow. Uh, that might not even be right. <laughs> Could be, I don't think it's black. So I, th I think you can take black off the list, but it might be. I don't know. Go look, find out, enter this contest. So, all right. Well, welcome. It's another week. It is a, hmm, it's a normal week, but we're kind of getting things back on schedule. I'll talk a little bit more about this under Dice Tower Productions, but we're kind of moving along here. We got some cool things that are coming from the Dice Tower. We have a lot of games to talk about. That is for sure. There are just games coming out our ears. Um, man, the number of games that I can I could talk about right now is so vast. And so, why are we wasting time just talking about talking about games? Let's talk about games. Starting with our contributors. Hi, it's Tarrant and Stella from Maple University and the Dice Tower. So we've been talking about board game as problem, which is a problem but not really a problem. This week, one of those things would be to forget a component or more after you close everything, pack everything, put in the shelf even, and you found, ah, oh, that's a card. Oh, that's a component. Has it happened to you often, Tarrant? Yeah, we do have our little pot of components that sits there until we next get that game. Like open. all the time. Um, not even that, if I like take photos for Instagram or something or scan cards or something for my video, I have done that before. I left that in the in the scanner and then I found it when the next time I need to use the scanner, which could be like a few weeks after that. Yes. It was like so sad. <laughs> yep, I think uh, I think the most interesting find was the uh, the catacombs gelatinous cube piece. <laughs> I forget where we found that, but for catacombs it, um, game. Yeah. Yes, but it it sat in the pot of things next to little nondescript tokens for quite some time. <laughs> We're just lazy. Well, it's good if we realize it straight away. We can just like okay, well, put put it down straight away. But then if it's been sitting there for a while, then that's probably gonna sit there for a while even further. So have you done that? As well, do you often do that? You forget things. I mean, it's good that you found it. If you left it at a public meetup, then that's probably not a not an ideal thing. Let us know in the comments. Uh, and we are from Meeple University and also on the Dice Tower. See you next time. Hey friends, good morning and happy breakfast. Kim here and we've got a bit of a situation here at Tabletop Rebellion HQ. I've got animal meeples escaping all over the place. It's sort of turning into a zoo. So, any idea which game this one is from? It's designed by one of my absolute favorites, Uwe Rosenberg, and it was published by Capstone Games, who I think always do a stellar job on their components. You guessed it, I'm talking about New York Zoo, one of the more recent installments into the polyomino game types, or as I like to call them, Tetris on a board. I have to be honest about one part of this game, I don't love the greens on the enclosure tiles. They're just too similar. Now, if you feel the same way, or if you have trouble seeing green, you can actually sort these out by the number of squares that's on each tile. So there's absolutely a workaround for sure. And that's probably my biggest complaint about the game. And it's not a deal breaker. They are thick cardboard, so They're going to stand up to being used every single game. The player boards are thinner, but they're sturdy enough and they're double-sided for different player counts. Now, what I do love 
are these animal meeples. And so if you watch our channel, you know that I love these kinds of components. They're great quality and they honestly show off animals you don't find that often in games. So we've got penguins, flamingos, arctic foxes, meerkats, tree kangaroos, and an elephant. They're painted wood and really great quality, and they stand up much better than I expected them to on the board. So if you like games like Patchwork, Isle of Cats, or Baron Park, another zoo-themed game, then I suggest you check this one out. Just try to keep your animals contained, or they'll take over. Hey, uh, so folks, you may have noticed if you go to BoardGameGeek.com that they have added our Kickstarters from last year. Not this year, last year to their website, so you can get those. And not all of them, but some of them. But I want to show you, we have the samples in for our, our stuff from the Kickstarter. So, of course, we have our dice dog here. We have our card trays. Now, this is the thing that I think a lot of people have not seen yet. So, the card tray... Basically, you can put the cards in like this, then it has the lid, so you can store it in the box, but you can also take it off, and this has a slight divot in here, so you'll be able to press against the cards and pull them out during the game. Um, then, we have the dice bag, which I'm very happy about. Let's see if I can fit my hand in it, because that's really what matters. Yes! Gargantuan hands fit inside. And let's see, we got our, our, our meeples here. So the little, like, I don't even know what these are called, meeples. I don't even know what they're, they're dice guys, monsters, turned into meeples. So they're dice eeples. Don't ever use that word. They look really cool. My favorite of these is the mummy, I think. The mummy looks really sharp. Oh, the ghost is really cool, too. They're, they're all good, but I like those the best. Here's our Franken-Die pin. So that's fun. But, of course, the playmat. So let me see here. You can see this is the big play mat. And then we have the, the smaller play mat, which is, you know, people like the different sizes of them. Both, uh, both of them, you can look at the bigger play mat here, um, has the stitched outside to them. Maybe I should, you know, open it the way it's supposed to be open. Oh, I love the smell of new rubber. But uh, you can see the stitched edges here. I really like this play mat, folks. This is fantastic. And then we got some dice. We got both the orange dice and the glow-in-the-dark dice. These look really nicely. They do glow-in-the-dark. I tested it out by going into a closet and looking at them. So uh, there we go, the dice with a six-sided die on the side, and then the 12-sided dice. But these are not really 12-sided dice. These are still six-sided dice. They just happen to roll like 12s, which makes them that much cooler. But I gotta be honest, folks. My favorite thing that we got here are the box bands. I and my kids are working right now at putting these on every game in our library. These fit right outside of the game. We got two different sizes. In fact, here's a game. This is called Mystic Paths. But you just put it on like this. And then it holds your game nice and tight on both sides. These are fantastic. The entire Dice Star Library, by the end of today, will have them on it. Um, so that's cool. Anyway, that's some of the stuff from our Kickstarter. Oh, yeah, coasters. I guess I should show those, too. The different coasters that you can get, the different monster coasters. So this stuff has all been produced. It is on the boat now, shipping to our distribution center. Once that gets there, ooh, there's some more pins, the ghost pin and the Dracula pin. Once that stuff gets there, we will start shipping it out. So if you haven't backed the Dice Tower and you want to get this stuff, go to DiceTowerKickstarter.com. You still have a chance to get some stuff added to there before we start shipping it out. Um, our shipping date, hopefully, is September. That's still our goal, but um, we'll have to wait and see. I mean, there's still delays and things that can happen, but we're looking good right now. All right, let's keep going. Brandy. Uh, 
Uh, can we play now? Hi guys, I am Randy. And I'm Ellen. And we are We Game Together, and we are back from a long hiatus of board game yeah. breakfast. And we're back as regular and, you know, about the same as we were Super before. Super average, we're not better than ever. We're the same. <laughs> the only thing that's different is the lights behind us. That's pretty much. And our table. But we are back with a new segment we are calling Gaming Related. Yes. We're super excited about the name because it took us one second to come up with it. Right. <laughs> so the first topic that we want to talk about, it's not specifically about board games. It's as, related. As most of these will not be. Right. Which is the point. The first thing we're talking about is... Just uh, bit storage. Yeah. like, Or maybe more towards, you know, game nights. Yes. Specifically. Our favorite thing that we've come across of all the different components or all the different options yeah. out there are these wood bowls. Mm -hmm. They're actually olive wood. So they got like this little... You know, marbly type mm, pattern. Beauteous. They're super, super nice. Plus, I mean, listen to this noise. Yeah, they they dull the noise of some of your more, you know, like coins and things like that yeah. that have kind of a teeny ring. It's the best noise. Very Plus, cool. It's kind of like they got two olive bowls and he's banging them together. <laughs> I think that every time. If you want to know where we got these, we just got them on eBay. It's not any kind of a sponsor thing or anything. We're just nope. happy to share them. They're fantastic. But other ones that we use also are these game trays. Yes. And these come in all sorts of different colors and sizes and yep. things. Uh, the nice thing about the game trays is, you know, if you got the extra cash to spend, you can keep these inside yeah, the game. Yeah, that's super And have nice. the storage and they're ready to go right away. Yeah. Um, they come in like all sorts of different split sizes and things too, like that three is very and two cool, and different sizes. sometimes bits are not all the same size, guys, and they yep. need different storage compartments. And you can use these for like personal supplies and things like that too. We don't care so much that we have a ready-to-go storage solution inside the box. Nah. Because I do like the olive wood bowls especially, that's our favorite. Yeah, and we mostly game here. Right, and you just, you roll them out, you, you just kind of... don't go anywhere. Yeah, if you're not on the go, they're, they're, they're pretty nice. Yeah. And even if you're on the go, they're not, you know, it's not that much more storage. Yeah. They're more room to you carry. You just gotta decide what you like. But they're just kind of classy looking, and they're nice, and they're just, they're super easy. They're weighted. They don't move around and things. So that's our favorite. I've even seen people use, like, silicone cupcake oh, containers. Oh, yeah. And that was really cool, There's, actually. like, the bit bowls that, like... Um, yeah, they clip on the ends, and then on. you can unclip them and, like, stack them up to store them. Lots of good options, but these are definitely our two favorites. So uh, yeah. if you want to know any more information, just hit us up in the comments, and we're happy to share. And we'll see you guys on the next one. Bye. Hey, board gamers. BJ from Board Game Gumbo here, back with another episode of Lanya. That's right. I'm bringing you games that won't break your budget, but throw in a little something extra. Here's what I'm checking out this week, and it's not a Kickstarter. Spotlight is a brand new game from a brand new publisher, Jack of Peace Games. It's co-designed by Adam Stichter and one of my favorite people in gaming, Jay Bell. It's a small box card game for one or two players that plays in only about 30 minutes. But what's the lanyap? At the gumbo, you know we love games that mix and match mechanics in a new way. Take Jiraku, for instance. It's area control, it's trick taking, it's up to four players, and a small box game that fits in your backpack or pocket. Sign me up. In Spotlight, the designers have smushed together trick-taking with area tr control again, but this time with some bluffing, deduction, and strategy thrown in. And this one fits into your shirt pocket. Now, there's not much theme, but that's not the point of this game. Players are going to play their hand of cards into areas to try to score points at the end of each round. After three rounds, the player with the most points wins. The game concept is easy, but figuring out how to win is the tricky part. For such a small box, there's a lot of replayability because each time you randomly generate the areas that you and your opponent are fighting over, you'll get a completely different setup with different rules to consider. There's 15 area cards in the box, ranging from the player who plays the suit with the lowest total value to areas that are looking for solo suits. And sometimes the areas just affect the cards you play, but each of them are worth different points. So evaluating what is in your hand versus what you can score, that's the thinky part. One more thing, the bluffing and deduction come in after players secretly choose a card to be their personal suit. That's the color that's going to score them points if they win those areas. But you also get the value of that suit in points. What a delicious decision. Do I play a high value suit for the points or for its color? Or maybe hold on to it so I can use it to win an area. Juicy. All right, so that's Spotlight from designers J. Bell and Adam Stichter and Jack of Peace Games. It's on the Game Crafter right now, and the more people that buy it, the cheaper it gets for everyone. If you like tiny box games with a big box game feel, you should check it out. And until next time, 
laissez le bon temps rouler. All right, I like the, the look of those cards. They, the, the style of the front of those cards looked really nice. All right, so what's coming from the Dice Tower this week? Well, I know tomorrow the podcast goes up and we talk about our top 10 gimmicks and games. They're cool, you know, like a game has a gimmick and we like the gimmicks that these games come with. What else is happening? Well, at 10 a.m. today, Z will be doing another What's Happening, so keep an eye out for that. I'll be back today at noon for another Q&A. We got reviews going up. Brian's reviewing Crack the Code. I'm reviewing um, a, ga a little card game called 10 from AEG. Monopoly Speed. Is there finally a good Monopoly game? Bug Hunt. Space Invaders. This is different than the last Space Invaders game I've done. I'm going to be opening up the new Mega Catan this week. I'm going to be taking a look at the trash game Escape the Night. Oh, am I spoiling my thoughts on it? Um... Shadow Kingdoms, um, the big review for me this week will come at the very, very end of the week, and that, or the beginning of next week. Or so, anyway, very late in this week, Descent, the new Descent. I'll be taking a look at that. And the guys are doing a four-square review the, the, of Anno 1800. So um, those are different things coming up. Tomorrow we have a live play of The Loop, the one we just talked about. So if you want to see this in action, um, we will see if they will win The Loop tomorrow. I'm predicting a loss. Outrageous. Yeah, as Mike says, outrageous. That's probably true. I think the game will win. Uh, Shoots and Marbles is back tomorrow. So come on out for that one. And uh, yeah, lots of different things going up this week. Crowd surfing. Uh, more shelf reviews. Uh, we have our sequel. Last week, we did our top 10 casual two-player games. This week, we're doing our top 10 advanced two-player games. Is there a difference? Will a game make both lists? Who knows? Find out. So, that's what's coming this week. Let's keep moving. Whether you're trying to control roads, forests, or even the entire world, it's all area control. But what is area control? Let's talk board game basics. In area control games, players will be competing to occupy specific spaces and gain benefits from those spaces. Could be resources, points, or other things. Different games will put their own spin on it, but for the most part, these are the basics of area control games. In area control games, players are competing to have the most pieces in a certain area of the board or play area. And having the most pieces in a specific area typically rewards the player with resources, points, or something else. So basically, in an area control game, there's going to be parts of the board or play area that do certain things, like score points or produce resources, and having the most pieces on that area will give you benefit. The classic example of an area control game is Risk, where players are trying to control different territories, and by controlling those territories, they get to add more armies to the board. And that game is pretty much all about area control. There are some other games that mix area control with other mechanics, like Carcassonne, which most people would consider a tile laying game. But the way you actually score points is through area control. Whenever you start a new feature, you put your meeple on it, but you don't score that feature until it's complete. And sometimes you'll end up with multiple players having meeples on one feature. And whoever has the most, in this case red, controls that area and gets the points, and the other players get nothing. And in Brew, players are trying to win forest cards by placing their dice on them through a series of turns. And at the end of the round, the player with the most dice on the forest card controls it, and they get to keep that forest. Now these are some really basic examples of area control games, but some area control games can get really complex. But they're all the same idea. Whoever has the most pieces in a certain area controls it, and they get whatever benefits come along with that control. And that's area control. Thanks for watching, and be sure to go over and check out youtube.com slash kidsflying so you can see all of our other board game videos. They're tons of fun. Have a good breakfast. Bye! If you check out Kids Planning, you'll see that I was, uh, they just interviewed me on their channel uh, last week, so you can go see that. Alrighty, so today I'm talking about the art of learning. Here's the deal, folks. We have lots of videos, and people are always asking me how to teach a game. And in fact, I will probably do a series of videos on that someday. We have uh, Matthew talks about teaching games. I mean, it, it, it comes up all the time. We have people on the internet who that's their whole thing. Here on the Dice Tower, we occasionally have Tim Chu on. He does a playthrough. Um, Stella will show games off. I do a little bit of teaching games in my reviews itself. 
Of course, we have the great Rodney Smith from Watch It Played and many other people, and I'm going to stop mentioning names so that I don't miss someone and they get sad. There's lots of great game teachers on the internet. I love teaching games. I like to open the rule book and run through it. I feel, and I might be wrong on this, you have to ask the people in my game group, I feel like I'm a good teacher of games, but perhaps I'm not, but I'm trying to get better, and I, and I feel like if I really know a game well, I can teach it excellently. I was a teacher in real life, hopefully those skills come through. But again, uh, maybe I'm not the best judge of that. That being said, I wanna talk about learning a game. Because why I think We're back, we're back, we're back, we're back, we're back, we're back, we're back. All right. That was my fault, folks. I didn't check my batteries before we started here. But they're back. I don't remember what I was saying here. Well, I got all that, but I mean, I'm trying to figure out where it went off. What was the last thing I said? Last you heard was when it comes to learning a game. <laughs> all right. So, when it comes to learning a game... Um, when it comes to learning a game, I'm not quite as good at that particular thing. Um, and so I need to work on that. But there are people in my gaming group, and I was mentioning how one of them lives in my family, and I see her quite often, who I think are pretty terrible at learning games sometimes. In fact, there was a small uh, argument about this yesterday. And it's just like, don't you listen when I talk about things? I get it to some degree. So when you get learn a new game, you sit there and there feels like there's a wall of information that just comes right back on you. Um, the, uh, you know, so that, that there's just this wall of information that comes at you and you're like, oh, I don't know what's going on. You know, there's just so much of this coming. And a lot of people tune out at that point. That is incredibly unhelpful to the teacher. There's someone in my game group who I have to teach every game to this person twice because I explain the game and this person just simply refuses to listen during the initial explanation. They would rather learn as they play through the game and then mess up and then say, you never said that when I clearly did. Um, and so I have to explain the game to that person twice. Now I get it. You don't want too much of a rules overhead at the beginning. You definitely need this moment of, oh yeah, that's right. You, I would, don't expect people to memorize stuff going on. But I think when it comes to teaching a game, there needs to be an effort between both the teacher and the learners. So a couple things come into mind here for me. So I'm trying to be a better learner of games. One of the things I want to do is know everything about the game if possible. So someone will say, yada, 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 and I'm like, ah, but what about this? Well, maybe they'll get to that. And I know as a teacher, I'll be like, I'll get to that. Um, sometimes a question is pertinent, but often it is not pertinent. And so I need to control the number of questions that I ask to the, the teacher. Um, I also, as a learner, need to grasp what I can understand. And then when it's my turn, I find that it's a good way to learn by saying, I am doing this, I'm going to go here. And it's better to try than to just go, I can't do it. I don't know what I'm doing, all right, whatever. Also, as a heads up, as a learner, we know you're learning, we get it. As a learner, I'm learning, we're all learning together. So A, no one is expecting you to do tremendously well. No one is gonna be on the drive home and go, can you believe the way that Susan was playing? It was awful, uh, it was, I know it was her first time playing uh, Terra Mystica, but I've never seen someone play that badly before. That doesn't happen. Just do something. 
You don't have to do your best out the gate. When I teach piano or whatever it is, you know, you don't expect that person to do amazing the first time. So try things, experiment things. I've seen people get so caught up, like I don't know what to do. So then just do something and see what happens. Winning the game isn't that big of a deal. Unless you're in some kind of crazy gaming group, there's no money being bet on the game. So I think a lot of times in learning, some people, uh, I know that some groups will tell you to read the rules before you come or watch videos before you come. I think that that's kind of pushing it too much. I think a lot of the burden for learning a game falls on the teacher, for sure. The, 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 the teacher needs to be the one explaining the game. But the learner has some responsibility there. Listen, learn, and don't worry so much about it. Like I said, it's really easy to, to zone out for a point. And of course, you know, this is an easy aside tool, right? How many times have you taught a game and there's someone at the table texting and they're like, yeah, 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 don't worry, I'm paying attention. <gasps> You're not. You just lied to my face. Every time someone says, yeah, yeah, I'm paying attention, in the history of humanity, I think that's been a lie, right? So we got to be cautious on that. If that person, you know, a lot of game groups lean on one person, um, then you need to give that person the benefit of listening to them so they can explain the rules to you. And I say this again with me doing this too. And yeah, you can be like, yeah, yeah, I'm good at multitasking. There's like scientific proof that that's not true. People really don't do better at multitasking. In fact, multitasking is actually a myth. You're just doing two things back and forth really f fast. The fact of the matter is, we all gotta work together to learn games. We all gotta not take it real seriously. The teacher shouldn't get upset if the learner makes a mistake, and the learner shouldn't be afraid to make mistakes because that's how we can correct things. Oh, I didn't know this? Well, here's how you fix it. But the best way to learn is to watch what other people do on their turns. And then if you don't understand, you're like, hey, I saw that you did this. Why did you do that? Because it is mind-blowing to me when I'm playing a four or five player game and the fifth person, when it's their turn, they're like, I don't know what to do. And I'm thinking, but you could just copy what person four did or person three. They all did different things. You could copy one of those people. Oh, yeah, well, how do you do that again? But they just did it. And it's frustrating to a teacher when you say, I don't know how to do something on my turn when you clearly weren't watching what the other people did because by watching, we learn. And that is, I found for me, one of the best ways of learning is if I'm like, oh, a new game, someone taught it to me, doesn't happen a lot, but someone taught me the game and I'm like, I don't know what to do. Okay, what are you gonna do in your turn? You did that, you did that, you did that. If all else fails, I'll do the same thing. Anyway, there's probably more to it than that, but I just thought that we should talk about the learners sometimes because yes there are great teachers out there and there are bad teachers of games but there are definitely bad learners you know we have some there are college classes where they teach you and there are books on how to study for classes on how to learn we talk about this all the time how to learn things and i think this is a conversation that needs to come up in board gaming because it's not just people teaching games it's not just bad and good rule books but it's also people learning games too Hello everyone, today I'm here to talk to you about Lost Explorers. Now this is a brand new game and to be honest, when I got it, I didn't know much more than it looked pretty cool. Now, it's a game that's got a very unique feature. The box is also the game board and it's also where all of the tokens and the tracks uh, live. So you've got the game almost fully set up by just opening the box. The issues, however, with the, some of this production is that it doesn't necessarily work as well as it could. Now, first of all, this is a very small board area. This being in the middle of a table, you know, as soon as this is across the table from you, it's quite small. And a regular board that, you know, you take out the box would easily be four times bigger than this. The next problem is with the tokens here. Now the game works because you put meeples down on these two areas. If you put one meeple down, you take the first token, and that will either then be a, a transport or a mission. If you put two down, you take the second one in. 
Unfortunately, these start to really slip down and it's hard then, without being able to look in the top, to see what's actually the next token. And I feel like this game has really suffered from overproduction in terms of it looks great. The idea of here, you know, open the box is basically all set up for you apart from a few tokens underneath. And it just doesn't work. Anyway, that is Lost Explorers. Still potentially a fun game for families, but not for me. Anyway, until next time, I'm Oliver East, signing out. Hi, good morning. Good morning. I'm Tim. I'm Lizzie. We are two player not to play. We are continuing our look at games you can pack in your bag and take on holiday. Nice small portable games. Today we are looking at Cat Cafe. Right, Lovely right, indeed. Really like this game. <laughs> um, it's small, compact. It's roll and write. Yeah. Really cute. And you have to draw. Yeah, it's not. It's not a roll and write. It's a roll and draw, it's pretty much. Yeah, um, it's just a bit <laughs> of artwork involved. Yeah. So this is uh, this is a really very simple, small thing. That definitely, you can fit in your packet uh, packing because it's yeah. it's literally a pad and four five dice and a, a pen seal. Yeah. <laughs> um, pen seal. <laughs> pen, seal. seal. Uh, um, you could use a pen. Uh, really, you roll dice and you try and allocate those numbers onto your. You've got five scratching poles, yes. uh, cat scratching yeah. poles, uh, and you draw. Uh, mice and uh, little things water cats, bowls so, yeah, water and ball. little house um, butterfly yeah things like that so yeah. you kind of and basically depending on how you feel your cat scratching poles the f there's kind of area majority type scoring mm. and there's first to finish a that pole kind of thing, type yeah. scoring um, and it's basically the one with the most points but it's a really simple nice yeah, engaging it's, a thir it's just 30 minutes but I think it's quicker than that probably yeah 25 yeah, <laughs> yeah 26 minutes <laughs> Brilliant great, game. Great on for holidays. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, recommend this one, Cat Cafe. Yeah. <laughs> Keep doing that. I can't help it. Enjoy your uh, <laughs> bowl of milk. <laughs>
let's say in three or four years, I might say it was amazing because all these things, we look back and that's where it started in Loki. This is where the bad guy here came from. This is where this sequence came from. And that's all fantastic. But I will say, and I love Marvel, and I, I don't care about the divergence from the Marvel comics at this point. That's a, a moot point. Marvel Cinematic Universe is head and tails above the comics. And I still read the comics. I, I love reading the comics, but the, the, the Cinematic Universe is better. But I was, frankly, almost to the point where I was ready to doze off in the last two episodes of Loki. There was the longest monologue I've seen in a long time. And I was like, okay, good, good. And now we're going to see something happen. And no, it felt like the series fizzled. It fizzled with a, woo, all this cool stuff can happen. And that's great. But I got to wait months and months and months before I see any of that cool stuff happen. There wasn't any, like, amazing moment in the last, and particularly the last episode. The second last episode had some cool stuff um, in it, but the last episode in particular did not feel like it. These series, uh, Z Garcia points this out here in the studio. He says that they, that they, um, they feel too short. It feels like there's not enough, not enough episodes in them. And I do agree, especially in this one. I feel like they could have added three more episodes worth of material, and I would not have been upset. That being said, I'm going to obviously watch the next one. I don't think it was bad. Right now, my rating is probably a 6.5 out of 10. I think the first episode was fantastic. And then the follow-up episodes were pretty good. And I really liked the fourth episode of the six a lot, too. But the, the fifth one was fine. I mean, I'm a big Gator fan. Um, and this, the, the sixth one introduces a new character who is obviously going to have repercussions. In the, and I think that character is very well done. Great acting. And I'm just a little worried about, like, I wouldn't even recommend someone watch it right now. If you haven't seen it before, I'd say, well, you should watch it, but wait till season two comes out. That's really, and I shouldn't feel that way. I won't say it about WandaVision. WandaVision, the problem was, we're like, just watch till episode four, then you'll be fine. That's, you know, that's what everyone says about WandaVision. Captain and Winter Soldier, it's, it's good. Although it, with uh, Falcon Winter Soldier, it really helps if you've seen some of the other movies. Loki, you do need to have seen a lot of stuff. And it's like you, I think to fully appreciate the Loki series, you need to have seen a lot of stuff before and a lot of stuff after. Well, I haven't seen this stuff after yet. So that's why this one is a little bit middle of the road. Loki is still my favorite villain in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I think he's really well done. Um, and I'm very anxious to see the future, but I'm just judging this as of now, and it's merely uh, okay. So there you go. That's what I think about Loki. Hot and stuff. Tea. Ready for a crazy round today? You never know what the cards have in store for us, do you? It's not the shift I'm worried about, T. I'm worried about you. It's like sometimes you just don't know what you're doing. Will you see hot and stuff? I never know what I'm doing. Let's do this. She needs surgery at uh, ASAP. Got it. All right, this guy's in rough shape. All right, got some syringes. We don't have any nurses. Where'd all the nurses go? They're all with patients, doctor. This is nonsense. Um, all right, what do you need? I need lungs, two of them. And then I need some more yellow. Let's go hot and stuff. All right, Dr. T. Syringes. Okay. Those are done. All right. Oh, jeez, I just oh. killed the patient. <laughs> this patient's healed. Okay. All right, I gotta move. All right, nurse, you are coming with me. Hurry up, doc. We're out of time. I need blood. This guy's not gonna make it. Oh, my girl. Yeah. Hurry up. Hurry up.
can't believe you dropped a lung. I can't believe you flipped a gurney. Probably a good thing it's a board game then, huh? It's a really good thing we're not doctors. True statement. And on that note, this is Rush MD from Artipia Games. Now, this is a follow up to their Kitchen Rush, which we haven't had a chance to check out yet, but uh, I think this game is pretty great. What do you think? I liked it a lot. Definitely fast paced and crazy. And uh, much like this game, we are out of time. So, are uh, you going to take this one? I'll do it. All right. Cheers. And that's it, folks, for today. Come back at in 20 minutes for. Uh, what's happening with Z Garcia. And then at noon, I'll be doing a Q&A. We have a contest at the beginning of the episode. If you're just joining us now, lots of other content, watch it there. We have much more coming for you this week. Until next time, though, I'm Tom Bass. You've been watching Board Game Breakfast. See you later. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production.